Wes Miliband is a partner with Atkinson, Andelson, Loya, Rude, and Romo, AALRR, a full-service law firm with over 200 attorneys in nine offices throughout California. AALRR represents both private and public sector clients with emphasis in the areas of employment, labor, construction, education, real estate, water, general business and business litigation, corporate and taxation. Mr. Miliband works out of the firm's Sacramento and San Diego offices. He is an environmental lawyer focused on water resources and environmental issues throughout California involving surface water, groundwater, and fisheries issues. Mr. Miliband represents public and private agencies, individuals, as well as a federally recognized Indian tribe. Mr. Miliband started his legal career as a deputy district attorney in Orange County, where he prosecuted 20 jury trials and several more before the court. Prior to law school, Wes was on staff for a member of Congress. He frequently speaks and publishes articles throughout California. More information about Mr. Miliband is available on the firm's website, aalrr.com. Mr. Miliband may be contacted at wes.miliband at aalrr.com or 916-920-6979. Well, thank you for that introduction. That's very kind. And it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. It might be morning, uh, depending on where some of you folks are, but it's wonderful to be here and a real privilege uh, to be able to talk a bit about California water and some of the different related environmental laws that essentially, and, and quite often historically, and I don't see any indication that this will change going forward, is that California often is the forerunner when it comes to environmental issues as a matter of policy, as a matter of law, there's a lot of factual and technical crossover with other parts of the country when it comes to geology and science, fisheries, uh, and all of those various issues that touch upon the four corners of our country and everything in between. So with that, uh, it's once again, a pleasure to be here and we will spend the next hour talking about water rights, droughts, and a flood of legal issues, part two. And today's agenda is intended to essentially build upon a presentation that I gave through this platform almost a year and a half ago, uh, about 15 months ago during October of 2021. And we will have a little bit for those who did not attend a lot of uh, potentially new information for you if you're not familiar with water law, uh, water supply issues, water infrastructure systems, which again, California's elaborate systems uh, really do translate well to other systems throughout the country whether you're of interest is in, as a water consumer, uh, given your household taps or farming, whatever it might be, or from an engineering perspective. And, and again, analogously, California laws tend to uh, have a, a big influence on what happens with other laws throughout the country. So we'll go through uh, really kind of these drivers behind California's water system. Uh, we'll tether that to the federal state and local agencies and how those different levels of government interrelate with one another when it comes to water supplies and the related environmental issues with, with fishery and habitat needs, whether under the federal uh, Clean Water Act, for instance, versus California's uh, what I'll call equivalent, the Porter Cologne Act and, and various statutory schemes like those. Then we'll get into a, a real small crash course about water rights and the water conveyance systems to then be able to move on to these environmental laws, the different agencies. And as we talk about these things, more or less in a vacuum from these different levels of government uh, later in this presentation, when talking about this third bullet point of recent droughts, storm cycles, and other current events impacting water supplies in California, Hopefully I'm doing my job well enough so that you can see the theme of the first part of the presentation, speaking a little bit more in the abstract with real on the ground pictures, literally some illustrations of these systems and, and some other graphics 
and information, but seeing it really live with what's happening here within the state and certainly elsewhere within the country. I typically like to start a presentation like this by really trying to get a big picture. So looking at the country, uh, there's what's called and referred to as the 100th meridian. And you'll see on the next slide that this, this really serves in some ways to help illustrate not just a divide down approximately the middle of the country, at least geographically with how it's laid out, but really the Western states. And within the Western states, often we hear the headline news from any major publication throughout the country about uh, the, the droughts or the floods. And frankly, those two are somewhat coexisting right now here in California as I'm looking out the window. Uh, from time to time, it, it is raining, it's been windy, it's stormy, it's one of many huge storms. I'll touch on this a little bit later to kind of give a real world life practical example of how what I'm literally viewing through the window is, is very illustrative of what we deal with as a matter of profession and within the industry. So now taking that prior slide and essentially taking that 100th meridian and uh, commonsensically being able to see that the darker red to orange yellow colors indicate drier conditions, it's really a good correlation to see that that left half, give or take a little bit, of the country tends to be the drier part of the country. And, and the Southeast tends to be most uh, moist. And for those of you who enjoy summers there, uh, get the humidity that goes with it. Trying to take this more uh, macro view of the country and put it more into a California context, California has uh, various ways in which, depending on which organization you're talking to, whether it's a governmental agency, a non-governmental agency, uh, a stakeholder group, whether for the environment or some other interest, an industrial interest, uh, there are different ways to identify uh, where and how water is used in California. And I like to think of it in simple terms because I do think it's a good uh, fundamental part of the foundation for for a water supply understanding of California to have what's depicted here and summarized as two thirds of the precipitation of snow and water originates in the northern part of the state. Two thirds of it is used in the south. And that's just given how the population is grown and dispersed uh, throughout the state of California. And so what does it mean to be north or south? Uh, there have been, as we know, Water wars fought throughout the history of time around the world, fortunately, uh, and hopefully this historical trend remains a truth, is we have not had that in California, but certainly uh, there are a lot of tensions, there are frictions, you hear about north and south splits. I myself as a Southern California native, but having been in Northern California for approximately eight years, have grown up personal and professional work lives seeing these different philosophies, these different perspectives. And uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, I'm grateful for it to be able to hear and learn how others think and how they view these issues that are of the most utmost importance, whether it's for a disadvantaged community who needs one of these basic resources for survival. And, and that's often lacking in, in different parts of our state uh, to trying to store water in one of our big reservoirs that exists or build another reservoir. So the point from the slide would be about the north-south division. I think typically, uh, and this is just speaking my own perspective based on my own experiences, is the red line that's intended to depict uh, the north versus south, that's really there more for where the water is actually originating from. Uh, but the probably in most folks' minds would draw that line from a practical purpose closer to the Los Angeles area, which is going to be in about the last quarter portion of, of the California map there. And that's more of a political policy operational reflection, I think, uh, based on how water moves around California. But the point is two thirds originates 
in approximately that area from the red line north. So forces driving California water. I could probably compartmentalize these uh, number of bullet points into a few categories. Uh, there's basically science, there's policy, and there's law. And, you know, I really didn't plan to put them in that order, but I think they somewhat belong in that order. And uh, I say that because uh, science and good science with sound methodologies, models, uh, having qualitative and quantitative criteria that account for deficiencies in models, you know, ultimately getting to the science, where is water originating, whether it's surface water, groundwater, how much is there during what times of year, really figuring out where it is, where we think it's going to be, and then being able to plan for it is what allows for, I think, this natural logical progression of the science to the policy making, whether it's at the, the state level through uh, the legislature or through the executive branches, uh, various departments, whether it's California's Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of Water Resources, the State Water Resources Control Board. Those are three of the, the, the key state agencies that you'll see and hear a little bit more about that really regulate and enforce when it comes to environmental and water issues in the state of California. And there are, to my understanding, uh, very similar structures in other states, particularly the Western states uh, that are very active and I, I think somewhat similarly situated in terms of their governmental regulatory and enforcement structure. So when it comes to California water rights, we are a unique state and I say that uh, because we have a hybrid system. And so I'm more or less jumping to the last bullet point here, but it's a good starting point as a point of reference. You know, what are the various types of water rights systems that you can have? Well, a lot of states in the country, whether on the East Coast, moving westward through, uh, you know, the Plains and the Rockies and getting here to the West Coast, there, uh, I don't want to say most, but a lot of states are an appropriative water rights system. And we'll talk about an appropriative right, and we'll do it briefly because a lot of these subjects are very worthy of their own one hour presentation. Uh, depending on the interest level, that of course can vary, but they're important, they're complex, they're nuanced, uh, but that it's good to know if there's one takeaway as it relates to the water rights systems that typically there could be a system where it's an appropriate, excuse me, an appropriative water rights system or a riparian water rights system. California is hybrid because it utilizes both a riparian water rights system and an appropriative water rights system. Again, more big picture of California's system beyond that hybrid dynamic is that water is a public resource and belongs to the people of the state. So how does that fit into having an individual water right well, that's been the subject of litigation for decades at this point, and will probably continue as uh, technology advances and there's a better understanding. Uh, you know, the classic of, of litigation continuing would be, it's a finite resource, it's more limited, it's in higher demand, that creates a recipe for disputes. Uh, you know, and I'm all one for trying to avoid those things if they're avoidable, and if you have to do it, you do it. Uh, but the point is it, it's a resource that belongs really in a trust capacity is how the law has come down as held by the state, but really with beneficiaries and fiduciaries as water right holders to have a right to uh, the water. And it doesn't mean a particular molecule of water. It, it typically means a quantity of water. And that right could be held by individuals, corporations, it could be public agencies, uh, there's industrial water right holders. So it really runs a, a garden variety of not only types of rights, but also uh, the water right holders themselves. Regardless of the type of right, uh, California water law, and this is pretty typical from what I've seen with other states, is that it is limited to reasonable and beneficial use. Those are two distinct legal terms of art. So what is a beneficial use 
is, is pretty well enumerated within California's code of regulations. So those uses would be things like domestic use. If there's the homeowner that is in a little bit more of a rural setting, might have their own well that they produce some groundwater from or a pump next to a creek or a stream that they divert water from for their household use. It could also be for uh, livestock uses, uses or stock watering to be able to temporarily store water for use by their livestock or treatment for their domestic needs. Uh, there's various scenarios, uh, but there's irrigation that could be on the commercial scale for, for farming. Uh, there's municipal and industrial. And we'll talk a little bit about how that, what I'll call a pie of different types of uses is essentially uh, divided up based on how water is used in California. But those are, that's a little bit of a flavor of the different types of uses that are considered beneficial use. So what's an example of a non-beneficial use? And that's where I think probably the best way for purposes of this presentation is to tether that to the reasonable use requirement under the California Constitution. And that is not to waste water. And Article 10, Section 2 specifically, uh, which was an amendment added back in 1928, almost 100 years ago now, uh, requires that water be put to its maximum uses and water not be wasted. So very, uh, very lofty goals to make the most out of the water supplies that exist in California. But within there are different ways in which water could be used and whether it's reasonable or not. For instance, the farmer who uses drip irrigation, but another uses flood irrigation. Some might consider that wasteful, but that could also be a reflection of the type of crop. There are financial considerations. And so really my point here would be that there's an inquiry that would have to be undertaken. It's, it needs to be robust. It needs to look at the factual situation to be able to really determine what is reasonable. Beneficial uses, while I said they're enumerated, that is not an exhaustive list, uh, but it's pretty well established as to what a lot of those beneficial uses are. The reasonable requirement is a little bit of a moving target as technology advances. So we might be seeing that a little bit more as a trend as to what's reasonable or not reasonable. Now I've touched on waste of water and that's clearly pr prohibited as I indicated through uh, the constitutional amendment. Types of water rights. So when I mentioned the hybrid system, riparian appropriative, riparian slash overlying as presented here on the slide it is framed that way because California law makes very clear that those two types of rights are analogous to one another. A riparian right deals with surface water, overlying rights deal with groundwater. And it really comes down to land ownership and I'll touch on that briefly in just a moment. Appropriative rights, a good takeaway point here, whether it's a matter of interest or you're a California practitioner or working on a project or if you're in another state, one good thing to know, particularly if you're in a state that has appropriative rights like California, there could be a statutory line in the sand, so to speak, uh, that treats those appropriative rights differently. So not only does California have a hybrid system, we have a delineation as it relates specifically to appropriative rights that are very often referred to as, in the law itself, referred to as pre-14 and post-14 appropriative rights, or pre-14 rights or post-14 rights, if we're gonna get a little more casual in our nomenclature. And the whole point to 1914 is that's when the state of California adopted its first water code that established the jurisdiction of the California State Water Resources Control Board. And it had a predecessor agency and it was renamed to the State Water Board uh, some years later. But that's the year when it took effect that California would regulate appropriative water rights by having a permitting system that is essentially a first in time, first in right basis, which again, when we talk appropriative rights briefly in just a moment, I'll come back to that point. Pueblo rights, there's a handful of those rights uh, that exist in California and that goes back to pre-statehood. And I'll touch briefly on those, but it's a very fascinating right and not very many of them um, in the state. In fact, you could count 
on about one hand how many of those rights exist in the state of about 40 million people. Prescriptive rights is really uh, a subcategory, I would call it, of the real property concept of prescription. Uh, so it's something that is adversely possessed to meet the statutory or, or case law elements to establish prescription, which typically has uh, what's here as something that's adverse, it's hostile, it's continuous, it's exclu exclusive, and it's open and notorious for uh, the other owner to see so that if they essentially don't act with diligence uh, within the prescribed time period, which here in California is five years, then someone else can claim those rights. Federal reserved rights, very fascinating area that touches on federal law. And this comes into, uh, this really does come into action in, in a somewhat regular basis, given the, the number of federally recognized tribes here in California, uh, military installations that are here throughout the state of California and public lands. So it's a good illustration of California being illustrative of so many other states where there are federally recognized tribes and or military inst installations or public lands, such as uh, the forest, national parks, and things along those lines. Repairing and overlying rights. Uh, this is somewhat of a text heavy slide. I will just move quickly uh, given the slides capture much of the essence of these rights and also for the sake of time. But the key distinction would be that repairing and overlying rights are treated analogously and for the reason, primary reason being that they are rights that are based on land ownership. So riparian rights, such as the little illustration here on the slide depicts, shows parcel A adjacent to a river. That parcel A landowner would have a riparian right that would allow a pump or some other diversion infrastructure or mechanism uh, to be installed, perhaps even dug, such as was done, you know, 50, 100, 200 plus years ago. So whenever I see ditches, canals, I'm thinking, wow, that's a very old surface water right. Is it a riparian right? Is it an appropriative right? Well, this illustration captures exactly what starts to go through my mind as a practitioner. Where is the, the water source? Where is the diversion point? Where is the place of use? And really those three items right there start the, the big picture thinking to get to the fine point details to do a water rights analysis. And that is water comes off the stream at parcel A, it's used on parcel A, riparian right. Now let's say it's not a river there and there's a groundwater basin that lies beneath the land. Well, similar idea. If there's a well that drills from parcel A down into that groundwater supply and then extracts the water back up and for use on parcel A, that is an overlying right. So you're basically diverting or extracting water from the same parcel for use on that parcel as opposed to an appropriative right, where mere ownership of land does not confer a right. It would be used on a different parcel, such as parcel B on the previous slide. Now, this, this illustration here uh, has a humorous component to it, but there's, there's quite a lot of serious history behind that. And even currently, and I have witnessed uh, in somewhat recent years, especially during the drought years, when dealing with water rights litigation or some kind of voluntary mediation process or a transactional process that is pretty cordial in nature but still contentious because of the limited supply and the needs of different water users, this is quite often how folks want to react and sometimes things have been uh, pretty rowdy and I want to say even close to physical I've observed on a few occasions. So it's a very uh, contentious topic, especially in our times of, of drought and appropriative rights, you'll see this quite often because an appropriative right is what allows that water to be moved from point A or parcel A to point B or parcel B. And sometimes that parcel B can be a block away, a mile away, or it might be a hundred miles away, such as when we do water transfers here in the state. Other types of water rights uh, are the prescriptive rights. 
and those elements that I touched on a, a moment ago, you can see here the Pueblo rights. Similarly, and there's been litigation uh, about those rights uh, from long ago, and it's still well established case law as to the existence of those rights and federal reserved rights, which has a very interesting, somewhat recent history, both from the reference here to Edwards Air Force Base in the Antelope Valley adjudication. I was in that adjudication for a number of years and was able to observe without, even though adversarial on paper uh, with the federal government, uh, there were plenty of other parties to have their disputes in this thousand square mile area basin that fortunately, in my opinion, we did not have to have a dispute, uh, at least for what I was doing on behalf of my client with the federal government over their federal reserved right. But it does, it's a common topic that comes up. I do tribal work here in California and I work for a tribe that has a federal reserved right. And uh, it's a very fascinating right when you look at it, regardless of it being a military installation, tribal uh, reservation or one of the public lands. So use of water, I'm gonna to try to speed it up a little bit here and get more to our, our recent droughts and some of those items. But I think it's good once you have kind of this conceptual understanding or familiarity with, with uh, the California system, so to speak, as I've described it. Well, that's nice. Now, how, how is water actually used? And so the pie chart I referred to a, a few moments ago in the upper right corner here, uh, hopefully is visible uh, with, with the percentages, but a good way to just look at it from a little bit more of a global perspective is that there's about 50% of the water supply in California that goes toward environmental purposes. And those purposes could be because of a uh, Endangered Species Act issue, whether under the federal, federal Endangered Species Act, under California's Endangered Species Act, uh, it could be because of Clean Water Act issues and having to have cleaner water help dilute more brackish water, such as what happens in our Bay Delta in the San Francisco area. Naturally, you know, river water helps push back the saline water from the ocean that literally flows in during the tidal flows under the Golden Gate Bridge. So about 50% of California water goes toward uh, environmental purposes. Now, there are voluntary programs such as habitat conservation programs or a lot of agencies, some of which I work for, you know, work very hard with the environmental communities uh, to help sustain and, and help the, the health of fisheries that, along our local rivers. That happens here on the American River in the Sacramento area. It happens through the Central Valley on the Tuolumne River and really various river systems around the state. The other half of the water uh, if we want to look at it that way, about 40% of that, uh, excuse me, about 40% of the 100% of water. So out of the 100%, you have 50% for the environment. About 40% goes for California irrigation. And as most of us know, California farming is, is just a massive uh, top of the list commodity uh, not only for the state's economy that makes it one of the largest in the world, but also for providing uh, food supply, not only to the state and the country, but throughout the world. So about 40% of our water supply goes for that use. And about 10%, which can seem pretty low to a lot of folks, uh, given the size of our state of 40-ish million people, 10% is for municipal industrial use, which means those household taps, or uh, the commercial centers where the shopping malls are, those sorts of things. So quantity and flow examples, this is just here as a more of an engineering illustration or some of the nomenclature that's used. AF is acre feet, uh, you know, which is about one foot of water to fill an entire football field. So when you hear acre foot, you know, that will typically supply two households up to one year. So just to try to give some context here when it comes to uh, water supply and quantities. Engineers quite often use CFS or cubic feet per second. There's a number of other metrics and ways to measure and unit out the water, but these are some common ones that we see. California's water system. We have uh, a good illustration and example here of the different systems and the two at the top of the list are the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. And the Central Valley Project uh, 
was built by the federal government back in the 1930s. State Water Project was the result of Proposition 1, a bond measure back in the early 1960s. And so construction commenced in the 1960s. And these two systems are interconnected. They do have interties. So how the federal reservoirs fill and then release has an effect and vice versa with how the state reservoirs fill and release. Just think about a ripple effect. What you do to one could or would, depending on the circumstance, affect another. So that's why the engineering is such a massive component to this. The operations and the operators and their communication, especially uh, in times of uh, potential flood curves and rules being uh, met so that they're not breached. They need to coordinate releases to help protect against floods and also make sure that in the releases, it's not creating a flood. So very complex and, um, and very hard good work that's done by a lot of folks out there to operate these systems. Colorado River Basin is here as another illustration of, of really kind of a Western state. I think Colorado River, and forgive me if I'm misspeaking, touches upon approximately seven states and ends uh, its journey into the Sea of Cortez and the country of Mexico has rights uh, to that. And along the Colorado River, there are a number of Indian tribes, there are a number of municipalities, a number of farmers, and different types of districts and organizations that have interests to the water in the Colorado. California receives a share, uh, which essentially goes to Metropolitan Water District, which is a large wholesale agency in Southern California. I mentioned uh, very casually and briefly a few minutes back, uh, the Delta, California's Delta. This is a natural uh, ecosystem that was, that was born or developed, however you want to think of it or call it, millions of years ago. And with fertile cropland, which is why it's been such uh, an astonishingly, and maybe astonishingly to me, because I'm not the scientist and don't have the background and training uh, to, to know a lot of the science behind it, but, but very successful farming grounds uh, and for hundreds of years now. And, uh, and so the Delta is a very complex system though, when it comes to what I was describing a moment ago about the inflow, the outflow of fresh water, seawater coming in, uh, and then the different habitat and birds and fish that, that live and rely upon this. Yet this is the hub to where California's two biggest rivers uh, meet. You have the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River. And both rivers have a lot of different and large sized tributary rivers, but ultimately the two big rivers flow into this area. And, and those rivers are what carry much of our snowpack. And that's where there needs to be the capturing of melted snowpack. So it's there for all of these different uses that we've touched on, um, while still allowing the Delta to operate in a way that, uh, that it was intended to uh, in its natural state, but still allowing for water to get to where it's needed, uh, such as Southern California. So this becomes a hub of having from a state perspective, and I can't speak for the state, but my observations based on what the federal and state governments have to do in the operations of their systems and, and California's different regulatory and statutory requirements is that the Delta becomes really the, the hub of water supply and operations and essentially a ground zero for disputes and trying to uh, preserve water rights while also meeting habitat needs, while also meeting what is often referred to as export needs. Those in southern portions of the state that uh, rely upon the water from this northern part of the state. So some of the agencies, this gives a, a quick flavor of different agencies involved at the federal level, reclamation is an agency that I commonly uh, have interactions with or will read a lot of what's going on with them, but there are a number of other agencies. Fish and Wildlife Service works on quite a bit of, uh, you know, the biology matters as does Army Corps of Engineers. And of course, uh, there are many others that could come into play. Central Valley Project I've, I've spoken about and for the sake of time, 
move on to state agencies. I've identified a number of these agencies uh, that are very common and critical to the regulatory enforcement part of so many of the California water and environmental requirements. The same for the state water project, but here is an interesting illustration of Lake Oroville. Some of you might've heard uh, a number of years ago, I think about six or seven years ago now, uh, Lake Oroville is where there was a dam failure approximately in that area where the illustration shows main dam. That is you know, long, relatively speaking, long since been repaired, um, but that's a big part of the state water project system right there. Local agencies. So local agencies uh, consist of cities that operate water systems and can hold water rights and do hold water rights. It could be what is called legally here, special districts. Special districts come in many different forms under the statutes. One form is an irrigation district, which like it sounds would, would be primarily a, a farming district. And so you have these local agencies, which quite often here in the state are the, the local water right holders that deliver to their customers. And depending on the particular agency, it could be really essentially a fiduciary for its customers who are the ones that uh, rely on the, the water itself, uh, might have put up land as collateral for the water 50, 100, 150 years ago. There's various historical examples that are very interesting from an academic perspective. But the point here would be local agencies have a key role. They often hold the water rights, or if nothing else, they have communities that are reliant on water, not just for survival in the household, but for other uses. Reservoirs, uh, I'll leave this one very brief. The point is, uh, even though this isn't the most current depiction, uh, reservoirs are, are hurting because of uh, drought conditions that have uh, reared its head again, despite the storms that we're getting now. So a lot of uh, what we've touched on so far is ground, excuse me, surface water, but groundwater uh, has long been relied upon within the state of California, but only in 2016 was there a statewide system that became mandatory for 127 basins, which covers most of the basins, almost all of the basins, I should say, here in California, it's for what are called alluvial basins, which is most basins. There are some volcanic rock basins, such as in the very north part of the state near the Oregon border, but groundwater is its own statutory regulatory paradigm. Other states have their own, and uh, California, surprisingly, despite my opening remarks, being a forerunner, California was among the last of Western states to uh, develop its own groundwater system uh, from a regulatory statewide perspective. And I have some slides on this in a few moments, but I'm gonna move fairly quickly through those. I think the important point is groundwater is a key component here in California, and it does have this relatively new uh, statutory system that's really starting to kick off with development of agencies and quote unquote groundwater sustainability plans. So the use of groundwater is typically around 40%. So like I say, long historical reliance and at a significant amount. The SIGMA legislation uh, was three large bills. So the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that took effect in 2016 was the result of three bills. And this illustration on the right is intended to identify the various basins throughout the state. And the darker the color, the worse the condition of the basin meaning it, more water, significantly more water is coming out of the basin than going back into it. And typically the water going back into it would be snow melt um, that's run down the rivers and then percolates in or rain precipitation, say in the desert areas uh, that only get typically one to three inches of rain, I think is what the experts would say. So forgive me on some of those statistics. But again, a uh, little bit more information here if you had an interest in groundwater and with what California is doing. This slide for Sigma identifies the goals that are intended by it of these, what are called undesirable results. And there are six of them here. So related environmental issues when we talk about water, often 
comes into, at least for me as a practitioner, what are the different federal or state uh, statutory systems? And then within that, what are the regulations? What are the, what does the case law say? But a, a starting point for me, and this happens on a regular basis, a, a client will ask, you know, we're looking to get a water supply for such and such area. What are my options? And very fundamentally in my mind, I'm thinking is it, you know, are there surface or groundwater supplies? And then from there, it helps me then compartmentalize and navigate what are the different supply sources? What are the different agencies that would have jurisdiction over that? Who are the suppliers, whether it's a public or a private or a landowner who has a well? And, you know, if it's surface, then it tells me I would need to interact with agencies X, Y, and Z. If it's groundwater, going back to those Sigma slides and that newer system, then it would tell me that I need to get more into those issues and interact more at that local level with those agencies. But ultimately, there's the ESA issues and there's the California Environmental Quality Act, there's the National Environmental Policy Act, those somewhat work in tandem. So that's a lot of what we see is federal and state have similar regimes, but very big differences in some of their standards, their criterias, and the different ways they've been applied and decided by courts in the state and federal systems. Meeting environmental demands. Uh, these are really, I, I think, go back to kind of the pie chart. So I'll just kind of skip past this slide, but it does have some interesting information to, to build upon some of the prior information. Just as this slide, problems with drought, uh, this is a real depiction of what the state uh, was, was looking like not too long ago. Um, our drought periods are becoming more intense and we're seeing more of this. The illustration on this slide shows the reservoirs and in a different way shows the impact of droughts and what it's doing with the blue lines being significantly below and some of these res reservoirs being significantly below the red lines showing that there's really not much left in that quote unquote bank account of water to meet ongoing and continuous or consecutive dry years of drought. Some quick illustrations of interesting uh, photographs that really illustrate what does drought look like? And boy, you can look at the forest and you can see differences there. Here, the, just really the local reservoir, this being Folsom Reservoir, shows what Folsom looks like when in a good condition and what it looked like not too long ago uh, in 2014 when it was close to what's called Deadpool. And a lot of the direct diverters, their pumps uh, were actually above the water line. And so they weren't even in a position to pump, but they had a right to pump uh, to be able to get to their customers and for those basic human health and safety needs. So dire circumstances have occurred and it's all about trying to avoid that, which we'll touch on in just a moment. Diminishing snowpack is a big part of it. Our headwaters, the changes in the snow, coupled with this really illustrative uh, macro view, literally from satellite imagery that shows the changes and here, this is speaking in the groundwater context, going from a relatively green state to almost a relatively red state in the span of 12 years. The slide with persistent drought is really uh, just showing the ebbs and flows for lack of a better phrase, moving on so that we can spend the rest of our time talking about recent droughts and storm cycles and other current events impacting water supplies in California. These are very recent, as in this week, um, illustrations from some of the local news uh, publications here in California with the illustration on the left showing the storm system coming through that is all over the news. I think headline, national news, certainly throughout the state. And these storms are moving through other states and. And that's hitting my news feeds just as a just as a regular citizen and and uh, consumer out there. But uh, big storm systems coming in. So here, you know, we've been in such a, a drought cycle. With now, when it rains, it pours, like the old Morton Salt commercial. And uh, the illustration on the right there is intended to depict what was happening over the weekend this past weekend with such intense storms and despite good planning and despite flood control measures and rules and releases, it was so much so fast 
in part because of being a warmer storm. So a lot of good snow that had developed melts, runs down. You couple that with the local rain and the intensity uh, in a short duration. Unfortunately, you often get this. And there, there has been a tragedy reported in the news as a re result of human life, uh, most likely animal life as well. So, you know, as real as it gets. So a couple of interesting statistical points here is, is that from drought to, to the storm cycles we're seeing, only a couple of months ago, uh, and I developed the, this point uh, that's articulated here in the first bullet point, which is California's driest six years occurred in the past 10 years. So California has been recording precipitation for 127 years. And six of our driest years were in the last 10 years alone. And not only that, they were consecutive years. So th two sets of three very dry, the driest years. So it was 2013 to 2015 with a little bit of a break. But again, when it rains, it pours. We had some of the wettest uh, precipitation happening in 2016 and 17, but then the drought coming back 2020 to 2022. Well, what does this mean now? as we're having uh, indisputably, I think, you know, very, very good start, a lot of precipitation with snow in the mountains, rain in the, the valleys, but last year started similarly and not much more. So uh, it's too early to say, and what does this mean? I think uncertainty is a certainty. So what do we do to try to to try to normalize uncertainty, to, to create the most amount of certainty that we can. And this is where I think it comes down to creativity. There's a lot more to it. I'm not naive or so naive to, to think, well, we can just sketch this out on a cocktail napkin and it'll all come together. Now, there, there's a whole host of factors in play. There's uh, different political positions. There's uh, policy views that attach to those positions, or maybe not. Uh, but there are finance considerations, there are environmental considerations, the list goes on and on. But ultimately to try to navigate through those different topics and issues or challenges is coming up with a list of solutions. And I think that really requires a high level uh, or a high amount of creativity uh, by having the right people together, which would be uh, those with legal knowledge, those with policy knowledge, those with the science knowledge, the stakeholders of various types and getting together to try to figure those out. So I'd like to spend a few moments on uh, some examples of creative solutions for an uncertain future. And this one's a, a very recent uh, coming from an article from just a, about a week ago that talks about ocean winds being used to develop two gigawatts of power or renewable energy uh, by utilizing the wind uh, from the ocean. Now, what does this have to do with water, much less California water? Well, quite often water uh, is utilized uh, by power plants to generate electricity. So in fact, the water that is used is uh, could either be groundwater, it could be surface water, either way, going back earlier in the presentation of that pie chart and 10% being municipal and industrial use, well, for the industrial part of that municipal and industrial use, those power plants, while we need them to be able to generate the power and create the reliability, there is uh, a, a very noticeable quantity of water that's required to get the job done. So a project like this potentially helps reduce that demand, particularly when it's scaled to a, a size such as two gigawatts, which uh, reportedly from this article that is cited here could power the equivalent of 900,000 homes. So we're not talking about a small in your backyard kind of project. It's like it sounds, it's, it, it would be in the ocean generating significant power and in my mind, as a practitioner and someone interested in these issues, you know, I look at that and there's such a nexus between water and energy and reliance from one on the other and vice versa, that when you create this kind of project, 
it's going to have an implication with the other. And I think here, a positive Im implication, whether intended or not. So a creative solution for creating energy and also one that can help, uh, you know, free up, if you want to think of it that way, a certain quantity of water that can go for other uses, even if that's storage in a reservoir for those dry years. Another example is the San Diego County Water Authority recently approved $275 million in upgrades to the existing Carlsbad desalination plant. Uh, now, this plant is very interesting. It was a natural gas plant for many, many years. And uh, I think it was owned and operated by San Diego Gas and Electric Company as a subsidiary of Semper Utilities. And so it's what San Diego County and its uh, residents and customers had relied upon for many, many years and still do, but in a different way. Instead of being a natural gas fired plant, it converted and became operational, I think December, maybe even December 1st, but December of 2015, uh, it, it came online. And I believe uh, the idea, and I believe the idea has become true, is that it delivers about 7% of the water supply to the San Diego County Water Authority's portfolio. Now the Water Authority has a number of retail agencies that distribute the water to the various customers throughout San Diego County. So that's a brief background on the actual project. And it's also a good side note to show a creative solution to even get to that point where the desalination plant became operational and came online that took uh, years and well over a decade to get to a point where litigation had come and gone, uh, whether on the environmental issues, on finance or rate setting issues, all of the things you could possibly imagine that come into play for a billion dollar project. And ultimately the necessary regulatory and permitting authorities got behind it, the public got behind it, uh, and, and perhaps not every stakeholder was satisfied to their full satisfaction, but it reached a point to where it became a reality and now is the next uh, extension of that. And this is part of the original plan, but it's also going to create environmental benefits. So I thought that was worthy to speak to all of the work that had been done by so many for so long to get the plant operational and now taking this next step at a very significant cost, nonetheless, to further the plan. Uh, this is one of those positives, in my opinion, of when not only is there that creative solution identified and you know the thoughts are put together, the process is laid out, uh, where there's disputes, the disputes either get resolved and or if they don't get resolved uh, outside of court, they go to court. One way or another, they're going to get resolved there as long and as expensive as that becomes. And to get to this point of being operational and now taking the next step to show such a commitment. And from what I've read in the news articles, but you each uh, take it as a grain of salt. And if you're interested, read and come up with your own view of it. But there's been a lot of enthusiasm behind it. There's been skepticism, and I don't want to paint the rosy picture as completely rosy, but I do think it's a good success story of creative solutions and now taking this next iteration um, to the next step. The Monterey Peninsula, this is a very, very worthy topic completely of its own for one hour, uh, which would be fun to do sometime because the Monterey Peninsula has a, a number of different challenges, both geographically, if you'll recall on prior slides, there's um, you know this elegant system of our central Valley Project from the federal government, the state water project from the state, and a number of others, San Francisco's Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, and moving south, there's a number of others. But Monterey doesn't have something that just, a system that just passes through it. So geographically, now there's state water project turnouts and some lakes and reservoirs, don't get me wrong, but geographically, it's a little more challenging. Um, there's been regulatory enforcement actions by the state there are mandates. So the, the short version becomes there's been a lot of litigation. There's been a lot of um, policy debates and uh, political frustrations 
is probably a fair way to put it to, to where it's a very contentious topic. And, and as reported here on this slide through the watersupplyproject.org website, there's a three-pronged plan that would bring a desalination facility that would help uh, resolve longstanding water issues that exist there. Again, that's, uh, that's coming from that website, but it's an example of a portion of California where there's geographical challenges, there's state enforcement orders, there's local differences on who's to blame for the crisis, whether it's simply that function of geography, is it mismanagement or is it too much growth? Uh, there's far too many factors to, to even speculate about to get into here, um, but it's an illustration of the complexity and the need for creativity and potentially um, having a desalination facility uh, such as what was done in Carlsbad to help not only meet mandates, but meet customer demands or needs uh, for water, if, if nothing else for survival and for disadvantaged communities. So what's next with it? Well, I think a lot of that's uncertain. So I'm gonna have to leave that maybe as a little cliffhanger and maybe we can revisit that at a future time, but very fascinating topic uh, to keep track of in terms of California water supplies. Other current events from around the state, uh, there are a number of them and it is impossible to even try to cherry pick a few, uh, but a couple of different types that seemed uh, very noteworthy here to try to give a, a different flavor and some of the different things happening here and a little bit of a transition about creative solutions to current events and the contentiousness that happens is the first item here, Waters of the United States or WOTUS as, uh, as often referred to as an acronym. And so that's dealing at the federal level of, of how Waters of the United States is defined and, and it seems like that should be a somewhat simple exercise if unfamiliar to, uh, well, what's water and does the US have an interest in it? Well, as, as most of us know in law, nothing is really that simple. Um, and certainly not when it comes to defining what is waters of the United States. And a lot of that has to do with a, a different, again, starting with science, policy and law almost kind of taking that approach to, okay, what does the science show is, is water? Because the law is defined that it's navigable. So what's navigable you know, becomes part of that discussion, but policy comes into play. So to try to emphasize that over uh, the past three administrations, uh, federal administrations that is, there have been different attempts or actually done um, to change the definition, which has resulted in litigation. It's gone back and forth. Uh, just very recently, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Army Corps of Engineers announced a final rule that revises WOTUS. It would become effective uh, 60 days after it's published in the Federal Register. So this is uh, really, again, an illustration that this is now the third consecutive administration to revise the rule. And it basically restores the pre-2015 definition. And the idea as advocates for it would say is to uh, basically restore and make the rule consistent with the 2006 US Supreme Court case known as Rapanos, R-A-P-A-N-O-S versus United States. So it's, some view it, and it's reported this way, as being a, a middle ground between those various definitions. Uh, but there is a complication for agencies and ultimately for those stakeholders or those local agencies that have to implement and comply. I think about this from a compliance perspective, very challenging. So, but there nonetheless uh, will be an upcoming case it's anticipated from the Supreme Court and the name of that case is Sackett versus EPA, Sackett, S-A-C-K-E-T, excuse me, E-T-T. And that will speak to presumably the scope of the EPA's power to define the rule, the waters of the United States. So that might be coming out sometime this year in 2023. 
Uh, very fascinating topic. I'm more of a water rights and supply practitioner, but you have to inherently understand water quality issues, and especially when it comes to these regulatory matters and uh, definitions such as waters of the United States. So one to keep an eye on. Uh, the tribal, federal, and state um, interties, there's uh, actually a relatively new lawsuit that was filed by environmental and tribal interests, and it's against the State Water Resources Control Board and the Delta that we spoke much about earlier um, is what's at issue there with the, the claims being essentially the water has been degraded, the water quality is poor, there's less supply available to not only meet needs or their rights, but there are disadvantaged communities. And it's done in a civil rights styled complaint. So it's uh, going to be, I think, another interesting one to watch. It doesn't directly fit within my day-to-day -day purview, but nonetheless touches on different things that come up in my practice. So I personally find it very interesting. Uh, and then even outside of practice, just to have an understanding of, uh, from a societal perspective, how this might be decided and implemented and what it means, I, I find very interesting and hopefully the same for each of you. So that was a little bit of the cherry picking. We're about out of time. Uh, there are some other interesting newsworthy items. Uh, and just one last one I'll touch on. And it's, I think a nice way to maybe in a small way, bring us full circle and close the loop on California water and its related environmental issues and tending to be a forerunner uh, for so much of what happens in other states throughout the country is that there's uh, an article that hit my newswire pretty recently, about six weeks ago. And it's from the, it's a publication from the California Department of Water Resources entitled Sustainable Techniques Bring Concrete Results. So making DWR infrastructure carbon friendly. So basically another type of cement that is used or will be used to help repair some aging state infrastructure and these canal systems, the state water project I was talking about, a lot of maintenance improvement projects, um, looking to use different carbon, excuse me, different materials that are carbon friendly, which is an illustration of trying to meet the broader environmental policy goals and legal subsequent requirements uh, to be carbon neutral. And by California standard, that means by 2030. So. That's a bit of a mouthful and, and complex to try to close it, uh, but I was trying to capture your attention and hopefully your interest and uh, providing you some with new and interesting materials. And I am happy to be contacted after this presentation and uh, my contact information, despite not being right here in front of you, um, is 916-920-6979. And I can be contacted by email at Wes dot milliband at aalrr dot com. And with that, I need to make my attorney disclaimer that this presentation is informational only. It's not intended to be attorney client privileged or to be dispensing legal advice. And my statements are reflections of my knowledge or my views, and perhaps not even, you know, in the context to properly capture my professional views, but it's certainly not a, uh, a spoke a spoken point on behalf of my law firm or any client for which I work. So with that, again, thank you for this opportunity and the time and may you have a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you.